What is God's will for my life? In this series, we have been tackling some tough questions that we sometimes tend to avoid. Why is there suffering in the world? Can American Christianity stand up to persecution? Next week, we will be discussing which horse will win the Kentucky... No, we won't do Uh, No, next week, really, we'll be talking about how can I forgive those who have hurt me? So it pertains to every one of us. And ironically, the questions we want to answer in this series are questions that Christians ask and that our culture in general often asks of Christians. And these are big questions and they deserve real answers because they affect the daily lives of everyone. But today we want to discuss a question that persistently perplexes people. What is God's will for my life? That's a great question and it makes sense. It stands to reason if there is a God And if he has a plan for us, then it's fair to know what that plan is, right? And while that question is often asked about specific situations or decisions, the answer is sometimes much more broad than that. And God certainly cares about our day-to-day lives, and he, he certainly has opinions on many of our daily decisions and choices. But even more than that, God has a big picture plan for each of us. Now, some people don't like to admit that they struggle with determining God's will because they see it as a a sign of, of spiritual weakness. But really, it's just being honest. It's just being transparent. The reality is that following a God that you cannot necessarily see or touch or hear presents some challenges. And one of those challenges is learning to know what his will is for your life. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, Verse 17, Paul commands us, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So we need to pursue this. This is not an option. The term God's will can be used in in different ways. It may be used to describe what he permits. It may be used to talk about what he performs. It may refer to what he prefers for our life. In other words, God is sovereign over all. And he permits certain things to take place while not causing them. But then he steps into history at times to perform his will in specific cases. These are occasions that are evidenced in both the Old and the New Testament, and especially in the coming of Jesus into the world. But most of us may be especially concerned about what it is that God prefers for our life. And we think about individual decisions that that we have to make. And we wonder, I wonder what God prefers. I wonder if he even has a preference in this matter. But what's his will for my life? And when the will of God is mentioned in Scripture, it is often referred to without being described. For example, in in James chapter 4, verse 15, it, it says that we shouldn't make plans flippantly, but we should first ask if it is the Lord's will. But James doesn't go on to clarify how we can find out what God's will is for our life. He simply says that we need to kind of run things, everything, past God first and to go through that filter. There are 70 different times in Scripture when the will of God is specifically mentioned. And just about all of them point to one of two goals that God has in mind for us. And so when you do an overview of Scripture, there are these two huge goals of of determining God's will for our lives. So let me take about 10 minutes and to paint a picture, uh, kind of a backdrop for you that, that we'll start with. Goal number one, when God's will is talked about, is for us to be like Jesus. That's one of his goals, is for us to be like Jesus. Throughout Scripture, one of the biggest things that the will of God refers to is our holiness, In other words, God's will for our lives is that we would be transformed, that we would be new creations, living a life that is free from sin. Now, let's let's face it, we'll never be sinless. We'll never be perfect like God is. But 
the longer we're a Christian and the more we rely upon the Holy Spirit, we can sin less and less and less as we draw closer to Christ. This isn't about legalism. It's not about trying to obey certain rules in order to be good enough for God. This is about us having a perspective of a loving father who longs for us to look like his son. And it's not about really working hard to keep from doing bad stuff. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, it talks about how God can equip us with everything that we need to do his will. So he wants this for us. He wants to make it happen. He desires that we look like Jesus. And his will will sharpen and refine and mold us into the image of Christ. It can be painful at times, but it is always worth it. A few months ago, I was calling up uh, some, some members who had lost a, a loved one and I was going through some different calls and toward the end of the call of, that I was having with an older church member here, uh, there was this lull in the conversation and all of a sudden she just blurted out, I'm not like all of my other friends, I actually like you. Well, that'll make you feel really good, you know? And, you know, it's not what you want to hear. That's not a real ego boost. You want to have, don't want to have that in your mind the next time you step into the pulpit, right? And so the funny thing was, I knew she really meant it as a compliment. But, you know, it, it just didn't come out that way. So where's, where's God in that? Where's God's will in that? Well, I wrote down her number, and it's God's will that I never call her again, right? <laughs> but God uses truth. And he uses pain and he uses circumstances to unfold his will. And sometimes his will just doesn't make sense at the time. But someday it will. You see, God has a plan for you. And there's a tendency to think that, that we have a better plan than he has for us. And so we're tempted to, to kind of deviate from the Lord's blueprint. But we need to trust it and we need to trust him. You ever had a friend that... Uh, had a baby, and they're so pumped up. It's their first child. They've got this baby. They call you up, you know, hey, just gave birth, and, and you want to come up and see her, and you want to see the little baby boy. And, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll come up. And so you go, and you go down to the hospital, and you find the place, and you go to the room, and the baby's in there with the mom and dad. You all been there, right? And they're just so proud. And they want you to hold the little baby boy, and so you hold the baby boy. And then the parents, they just dive in with this question. Who do you think he looks like? Who do you think he looks like? Well, let me just tell you what is going through every guy's mind when they go in that room. Who does he look like? He looks like a baby. The dude is two hours old. He looks like Winston Churchill, right? <laughs> I mean, and that's what you're thinking. Yeah, he's, that's Winston Churchill. Yeah. You think that, you don't say that out loud, right? And they say, who do you think he looks like? And you go, ah, you know, I don't know. He's got, uh, he's got two ears and you got two ears. You know, I mean, you're... <laughs> You're looking for anything you can, right? But then what happens over time? You stay in touch with the family. You watch the boy grow up. You see little glimpses. You see a resemblance here and a resemblance there. And then you go to the graduation party that's at their home 18 years later. And you see him over there talking to his friends. And you see his stance. And you see his chin. You see his laugh. You, you see all these different attributes and you say he is a spitting image of his father. Why is that? Because over time, a transformation has taken place. And that is our desire and that's God's will for us that, that we would bear an uncanny resemblance to Jesus Christ. To look and to be like him in, in, in the way that we speak truth, in the way that we share hope, in the way that we spread encouragement, in the way that we love others. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 is my favorite, my favorite scripture. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Some translations say when they saw that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they took note and they were astonished that they had been with Jesus. Jesus. What confirmation that Peter and John were doing God's will to have people notice and, and see a glimpse of Jesus in them. And there's a foundational step we have to ask that question. How can I become more like Jesus? 
because that will always point us closer to God's will. And sometimes that will mean doing hard things and difficult things and making unpopular choices. Sometimes doing God's will or accepting God's will is embarrassing or painful or humbling. But if in time it causes us and allows us to look more like Jesus, we must embrace it. Just as Jesus did when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, not my will, but your will be done. And we have to pray that sometimes too. And we have to know God's will won't always keep us out of harm or difficulty. Sometimes it will actually lead us there, but it will always make us more like Jesus. So the first goal in determining God's will is to be like Jesus. The second goal of his will is to be with Jesus. You see, that's our ultimate goal. Ultimately, God's will is for us to be with him in heaven. No matter what we face here, no matter how hard it gets, no matter what choices we make, no matter how many times we've missed his will in the past, more than anything else, God wants you to be with him for all eternity. And his plan revolves around seeking and saving that which was lost. His will is centered on us becoming more like Jesus so that we can point others to him. And what this means is that at the heart of God's will is this deep love for you. The God of the universe has plans for you and then the ultimate goal is for you to be with him. And so if we're gonna be with him in eternity, we might as well be hanging out with him and getting close with him now. I like the way that one of our former preaching interns explains it. Jamie Snyder says this. He says, sometimes God's will seems mysterious, but what we want is just the opposite. We want crystal clarity. We want writing to show up on a wall. We want a plane to write it in the sky. We would love for God to send an email directly to our account to assure us every step of the way that we are following his plan. That's why one of the reasons so many people move through life in neutral, spiritually speaking, is because they are waiting for some big obvious sign from God. And in the meantime, they just stay in neutral because they're always going to stay in neutral and go nowhere fast. These people are constantly waiting for some kind of a sign from God. And in the absence of clarity, many people do not necessarily choose the wrong thing. They just don't choose anything. Mother Teresa once said, I never had clarity from God. I just had trust in God. We want simple steps to complex challenges. But it's not always that simple. I, I understand why we do this. I, we want God to fit into our box. We Just make it clear. Make it predictable. But that's not the way determining God's will works. If it did, then what would happen is then we would be wiser than God because it would just be following a step-by-step layout of what it is that we're supposed to do. And yet when we follow God, it's not like that. It is an adventure. It is a journey that takes you on some unexpected roads and there's some unpredictable turns. Well, with my remaining time, let me just talk about a few practical ways to know God's will. And we have this tendency to kind of push our thoughts onto God's plan. You ever been around people who will say, you know, oh, well, you know, I prayed about it and, and this is what God, God told me to do or this is what God showed me to do. And you're like, really? Because that seems really strange and it doesn't seem consistent with, with what godly counsel might, might say, but that's where God led. Yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. And people use God as an excuse to live however they want. So we have to make certain that we don't just manipulate the system I, I did my internship years ago at the Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky, and I worked with a man by the name of Wayne Smith, and Wayne is just a pastor deluxe. He taught me how to love people. He modeled that for me, just, just an incredible man of God, and, and he taught me how to overcome a lot of struggles in my life and how to resist temptation. There's one temptation that Wayne has always struggled with, and, and that has to do with sweets, and if you know Wayne or have ever seen him, you realize that he, he loses that battle an awful lot. 
Uh, one time during my internship, he came into church. He had a big bag of donuts with him. And he was kind of smiling as he walked past me. I said, hey, I said, you got some donuts this morning. He said, yeah. He said, but it was God's will. <laughs> I said, what do you, I, I knew he wanted me to ask. I said, what do you mean it was God's will? He said, well, he said, before I went to the donut store, I prayed and I said, Lord, if it is your will that I am supposed to have some donuts, then you make certain that there is an empty parking spot right there in front of the donut store. I said, was there? He said, on the seventh time around, there was one right there, you know? And I think he was telling the truth is a sad thing, you know? But at times we can sometimes allow our personal preferences to sway the process. I, I sometimes will say, I'm going to put a fleece out before the Lord. And it's a term that refers back to a story in the Old Testament about Gideon. But it's kind of like where we say, okay, Lord, make this really clear for me. And if, if this happens, then I will interpret that, that, that you want me to do this or you don't want me to do that. And that's not always the best way. I'm sure it works sometimes, but it's probably not always the best way. I think sometimes we, we can try to determine God's will based upon open doors and closed doors. And, and lots of times I'll do this is I'll say, Lord, I'm so dense, make it really clear. I don't know whether I'm supposed to do this or to do that. So will you block the path so that this is totally shut off? And will you open wide the other path so that there's no way that, that I can miss it in my foolishness? And I think sometimes that works. But can I tell you the two best ways to know God's will? And I just want to make certain that you know these are the two best ways. Number one, read God's word. Read God's word. God's word will never contradict God's will. Ever. God's will will never contradict God's word. When you understand who God is and you realize there can't be any duplicity between, in, within that which is divine, it could never happen within the nature of God. And so we have to consult God's word. This is our owner's manual. This is how we seek direction. For instance, if you're considering getting engaged to a person that doesn't share your same love for Christ, should you marry that individual? Well, what does the Bible say? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? But we read the scripture, and we know what we're supposed to do, and our tendency is to want to decide what I think I should do, and then to start kind of heading in that direction. When it comes to saving a marriage, when it comes to breaking a habit, when it comes to pursuing righteousness, sometimes people will ask me, well, what do you think God's will is? Or what do you think that I should do? And what I really, truly want to say to them is I, I want to say, if I were to clearly explain to you what God has expressed in his word on this topic, would you actually do it anyway? You see, we should have a desire to know God's will, but we also need to have that desire to follow through with it. You ask, well, Dave, is, is it wrong for me to sleep with my girlfriend? I mean, we're, we're probably going to get married, and I really love her. Or change the scenario. You say, Dave, my marriage has been lethargic. It's been loveless for years. But when I'm at, at work, the chemistry is electric with my coworker, And it's, it just, I mean, it just really... It's becoming physical. But I know God brought us together for a reason. Well, what's God's will in those situations? Well, we look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lusts like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. So read God's word. The other way that I think is a, is a great way 
is to listen to God's people. This is one of the reasons why we encourage you to to build some strong Christian friendships. You need people who know God's word and seek to follow it, even when it's unpopular. When you are at an impasse, you can go to them and, and ask for their godly counsel and wisdom. They can have a different set of eyes and ears to help you out. So choose those friends wisely. John Maxwell says it like this. He said, your companions are like buttons on an elevator. They can either take you up or they can take you down. And sometimes we say, well, we we can't figure out God's will. And yet deep down in our heart, we have more of an understanding than we let on. It may just be that we aren't as eager to find out God's will as we are anxious to be relieved of the responsibility of making a decision and living with the consequences of our actions. My pastor friend Craig Groeschel says, often the difference between where I am and where God wants me to be is the pain I'm unwilling to endure. There's a prayer that you've prayed I don't know, maybe thousands of times, depending upon your age. It's the Lord's Prayer. You memorized it, and sometimes if we're not careful, we just kind of kick it out, and we don't even think about the words. But I want you to think the next time you say the Lord's Prayer, I want you to think about this phrase. The phrase is, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Do you really mean it? Do we really mean it when we say to a sovereign God, your will be done on earth, in my life, in my daily life, your will be done. Do you mean that? In over 30 years of ministry, this is what I've observed in my life and also in the lives of others. I've learned that 95% of the time, Christians don't have as much of a problem with determining God's will for their life as much as we have a problem with doing God's will. That might sound harsh, but it's true. It's true for me. Maybe it's true for you. And instead of relying on the wisdom of the word or relying upon the leading of the Holy Spirit, we listen to Satan's whispers that that prompt us to look out for number one. I mean, after all, God wants us to have all these things. And God wants you to have a career that has some great status attached to it. And God wants you to be happy. No, God wants you to be holy. And if you are holy, you will have a happiness and you will have a joy that the world cannot take away and that joy will come from the journey that you've been on with Jesus because you put a smile on the face of the creator of the universe when you are holy. You may have never noticed this, but God points out another way to know what his will is, and it's it's made possible when we pursue the mind of Christ rather than blending in with this world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So he says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. One paraphrase says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but let God transform you. Now notice this is key. The secret here is that there is God's part and there is our part. God's part is transformation. Uh, Think about the transformation that takes place from a caterpillar to a butterfly. In fact, it's the same word that's used here in the Greek here in Romans chapter 12. It's the word metamorpho, which means it comes from metamorphosis, this dramatic transformation that takes place. And that's what's taking place when a a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Understand this, a caterpillar doesn't do anything. They do nothing in the process. All they do is submit to the process of transformation. And that's what God wants you to do. God just wants you to submit to the process and surrender to him. That's your role, is to surrender. When I was a kid, uh, my older brother was two and a half years older than me. He still is two and a half years older than me. (laughs) Amazing how that works, isn't it? But he was always taller, he was always bigger, he was always stronger than I was. And young kids growing up, we'd be out playing, we'd be out all afternoon, and you know how kids get and we just would 
you know, we would get in arguments, we'd get in deep discussions over backyard baseball games, whatever it might be, riding our bikes someplace, and lots of times it would end in a big wrestling match. This was not good for Dave, all right? Because the same scenario would unfold each time. What would happen is eventually, even though I was faster than he was, he was stronger than I was, and if he got a hold of me, it was curtains time. And I mean, I would get in this situation where he'd have me in a headlock and I'd think, man, my head is gonna pop off, right? Or he would, he would have my arm and I'm thinking, my arm is gonna be out of socket in another five seconds, right? And so you get to that point where you have no hope, there's nothing you can do, and so what do you do? I, went, I made a list on Saturday of all the different phrases that I would say at that stage. Uncle, uncle, I don't know why you say uncle, but you say, I said uncle, right? Say, I give, I give. I say mercy. I said mercy a whole lot. <laughs> I say mercy, mercy. Sometimes I say you win, you win. I surrender. Regardless of what phrase I would yell in that frantic moment, what I was acknowledging was this. I was saying there's no way out. You are stronger, you are more powerful than I am, and so I am at your mercy. And if you want to know what God's will is for your life, you need to surrender. You say, I give. And while the process can be painful, in time the journey can become joyful when you realize you are walking in his will and not your own. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And Jesus used a different analogy to communicate what was his will for our lives in John chapter 15. Just so you understand the setting, this is the final night before Jesus is crucified. He's walking along with his disciples that night before. They come upon a vineyard, and Jesus used a very familiar imagery of their day to paint a vivid picture of his will for them and also for us. Listen to John 15, verses 1 through 4. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And as the passage continues, Jesus begins to sound like a broken record player. In 11 verses, 11 different times, Jesus uses the word abide, abide. A few months ago, a few years ago, Kyle, in the sermon, kind of walked through an imaginary dialogue between God and us. And it went like this. God asked, so you really want to know what my will is for your life? Yes, yes, yes. What is it? What is it, Lord? Abide. But uh, what, what, what about my college choice? And, and what about my major? Abide. And then once I graduate, what, what specific career should I choose? Where should I work? Abide. You know, what about the dating decision? I, I, need to, I need to know that right now. Should we date or is this the one I'm supposed to marry? And, and if so, when? And if not, who? How will I know? Abide. Well, what about the financial challenges I'm facing? Do, do I rent? Do I buy? Do I sell? Do I invest? Abide. And Kyle says, listen, I, I know how frustrating this probably feels because these are very real questions we ask and we wonder about in life. And if you ask Jesus these very questions and others, I think often what he would say and what he would want us to hear him saying is, abide. Remain with me, stay with me, draw near to me, spend time with me, connect to me, abide. And if you are like me, you want more than that. We want more specific direction from God, but God doesn't want more from you. He wants more of you. And that is his plea, and that is his hope, and that is his desire, and that is his will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, 
it is painful sometimes to decide to accept your will and not live for ourselves. And sometimes it is kind of tough to determine what your will is. And we realize that we, we have a flashlight that lets us see two or three steps in front of us. And you have a floodlight and, and you can see miles and miles in front of us. So Lord, would you just give us the faith and the trust to take that step, to take those two steps just as far as we can see and to continue to trust that you are leading us in the right direction. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let me tell you, God's will is for you to accept his son, Jesus Christ. He went to some incredible lengths to make that possible for you to be saved. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, we give you that opportunity. There are others of you who need to say, I want to, I want to make Southeast my church home. If you have that decision to make, maybe today's the day for you. There are others of you that just need someone from our prayer team back here to, to pray with you or for you. Whatever your decision might be, you meet me down front as we stand together and as we worship.